psychology class. Um, if we were in person, I'd be able to see all your wonderful smiling faces, but um, we're going to have a few interactive um, moments where I'm going to ask you to answer some questions in the chat. And then after the lecture is open, it's after the lecture is over, I'm going to answer any questions that you might have about psychology at Mary Washington or anything else that I can answer from a faculty perspective. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing some of those questions from you. So today we're going to learn a little bit about something called operant conditioning. So this is a lecture called Why We Behave. Um, and Operant conditioning was developed by a man you may have heard of named B.F. Skinner, and he was considered a radical behaviorist. And what that means by radical is that he felt like every aspect of our behavior um, was controlled by the consequences of our, of our previous actions. So we didn't have any free will. We didn't make decisions on our own. We were basically just directed by the previous things that have happened to us. And these rules of operant conditioning could pretty much predict all of the behavior that we have. So we're going to learn some of those rules today so that maybe you'll be able to predict your own behavior or other people's behavior um, a little better. So there's two main terms that are important when you think about operant conditioning. And you've probably heard of them, and they are reinforcement and punishment. And these are both things that happen after somebody does a behavior. And it's important to understand what they mean. You've probably heard of these terms before, and you probably think reinforcement is something good and punishment is something bad. And that's kind of true, but it's not entirely true. And that's where people get a little bit confused. What reinforcement actually means is that after a behavior is reinforced, it becomes more likely in the future. So reinforcement is anything that makes a behavior more likely. So here's a little picture of a dog, and he's given a treat for begging and going woof, woof, woof. And um, next time, he is more likely to beg like that because he got his treat. And then here's punishment is the opposite. It makes a behavior less likely in the future. So I don't know why this little dog is getting punished for having that cute little woof woof um, pose, but he's, he does this cute little beg. Maybe he's at the table begging for food. He's not supposed to do that. And he's been told no. And so the next time maybe he's at the table, he becomes less likely. So, so Sometimes people get confused and think reinforcement is all things good and punishment is all things bad, but that's not accurate. So reinforcement is anything that makes the behavior more likely to happen, and punishment is anything that makes the behavior less likely to happen. Okay, so just as a review, reinforcement is the process by which a stimulant or event strengthens strengthens or increases the probability of the response that it follows. So first you do something, um, you do a behavior, and then the reinforcement strengthens the probability that you're gonna you're that you're gonna do that again, right? That you're gonna do the behavior again. Okay. Now we're gonna talk about positive and negative reinforcement. So here's one of the trickiest things in psychology. I mean, that's a big statement, but this is something that students get confused all the time because they're because reinforcement and punishment we'll talk about can be both what we call positive and negative. But the word positive and negative don't mean what you think they mean. I always like to think of that um, scene from The Princess Bride. I don't know if any of you have seen The Princess Bride, but you know, if you have, you might appreciate this, where he's like, inconceivable. And then he goes, that word, I do not think it'll mean what it think it, I do not think it means what you think it means. So in this case, I say positive and negative. These words, they do not mean what you think they mean. You think, right, positive is good, right, and negative is bad. That would make a lot of sense, right? But that is not what they mean in this case. In this case, positive means something is added to the situation, and negative means something is taken away. So it's super important to understand that positive and negative, they don't mean what you think they mean. They mean positive means added, and negative means removed. So if we put that together, where reinforcement increases the likelihood of future behavior, positive reinforcement is something that's added, right? 
that increases the likelihood of future behavior. So what would have to be added that would make you want to do the behavior again? It's going to be something good. So in this case, positive reinforcement is the same thing as reward. I'm sure you've heard of the word reward, right? Um, it's a pleasant consequence. Positive reinforcement is anything good that's added in this. There's a picture of he's giving you money. Yay, that's good. We'd all love to get some money. Or maybe it's a high five or a gold star, or just somebody saying, good job, you did great. Positive reinforcement is a reward, or it's giving the dog a treat. Anything that makes you more likely to do the behavior in the future. Got it? Okay. Now we're going to get to negative reinforcement, which is confusing because you think if, if you get yourself confused again about the word negative and you think that negative is bad, then it's like negative, bad, but something good. You got to forget that neg you know, negative does not mean bad. Negative means taking away from the situation. So what would we have to remove to be reinforcing, to make you want to do the behavior? What would have to be taken away that if something was taken away, you'd be like, oh, that's awesome. I want to do that behavior again. Well, it would have to be something bad, right? It would have to be some kind of a negative stimulus. So negative reinforcement, for example, if you have an umbrella up, the rain is that. It's negative, right? You don't want that rain on your face. And so you're more likely to put an umbrella up in the future because the unpleasant consequence is removed after your response, right? So um, negative reinforcement is when something unpleasant, something bad is removed from the situation. And then you'd like to, you'd like to do it more, right? <laughs> Somebody in there needs to mute. I can hear some background. I don't know. I don't know who that is, but if you have background noise and you're not muted, mute because it's going to be distracting. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate that. Um, somebody says they're having difficulties and she cannot hear or see anything. So I hope other people can hear and see. Try refreshing your screen, Catherine. If you refresh it, it should hopefully correct it so that you can hear. Here, I'm going to enter that as in the chat. Um, Catherine, refresh your screen. Okay. Can other people hear and see? Is anyone else is anyone else is having trouble hearing or seeing? Please message um, in the chat. Otherwise, I'm gonna keep going. I can still hear and see. Thank you, Brandon. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Soon I'm gonna have lots of messaging in the chat. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. Excellent. So I'm gonna move on and hopefully, Catherine, you can get it to work. Um, so where we were was that we were saying that negative reinforcement is removing something negative. So removing the rain or removing something that was that might have been a punishment. Now reinforcement can be also what we call primary or secondary. So a primary reinforcer is something like food that inherently satisfies some kind of a basic physiological need. need. Um, so food or water or anything that like is a basic need is a primary reinforcer. You could probably argue that like love or affection is a primary reinforcer. That one's kind of on the edge, but I think we do have a basic need for love. Um, and but mostly when people think about primary reinforcers, they think about food or drink that are real primary. Um, Secondary reinforcers are things that don't inherently have, meet any basic need that we have, um, but are associated. We come to learn that these are good things, like a gold star, or a high five, or um, a medal, or grades. So I have a quick question um, I want you to answer in the chat. What do you think of money? Is money a primary reinforcer or a secondary reinforcer? If you want to pretend we're raising hands in a real class and put it in the chat, what do you think about money? Somebody, somebody take a guess in the chat. Somebody said secondary, 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 and somebody said primary. Well, it's secondary because money, you can't eat money, right? You can't drink money, but money is a pretty very closely linked to primary reinforcers. That's why it's a confusing one. And so that's why I asked it, because money can very, very quickly buy um, 
buy us food and drink and all those primary things, but money itself is a secondary reinforcer. We learn, right? It's just a really just a piece of paper that we've been taught and because our society all agrees that it uh, can buy these primary reinforcers for us. Um, okay, now let's talk a little bit about punishment, okay? So punishment is, is something that weakens or reduces the probability of the response that follows, remember? So after punishment, um, the, the, the behavior is less likely to happen. So here's a picture of a girl and she's going into timeout. We're gonna talk about timeout. That's a very specific kind of punishment. Um, like reinforcers, punishers can be primary and secondary. So a primary punisher is something like, it is inherently punishing if you break your arm, right? Often primary punishers are natural consequences. You climb that tree that was too dangerous and you fell and you broke your arm, right? Um, Secondary punishers are things that inherently don't hurt us, right? Um, but we've learned to associate with, with negative feelings. So an F, which I'm sure would never happen to any of you on a paper, right? Or even somebody saying no, right? Um, would be secondary or demerit, right? Or that kind of thing would be secondary punishers. They're not inherently hurting us, but they feel bad right, they, um, because they've been associated with other kinds of punishers. Now, like reinforcement, punishment can also be positive and negative. Now, this is where people's minds get so confused because positive punishment, that sounds like an oxymoron. How can it be positive and a punishment, right? But remember, positive does not mean good. Positive means added. So positive punishment is actually the worst kind of punishment. If something is added to punish you, to make you less likely to do the behavior, then the thing that was added was probably something really bad, right? It could be a primary or a secondary, but it was probably something like a no, or a, you know, you hurt yourself, right? It could be a primary punisher, like a shock or a no, right? Well, no would be more secondary or, um, a spanking would be a primary, a positive primary punishment, um, or it could be secondary. It could be a secondary punishment, like a like a bad grade, but it's some kind of unpleasant consequence, right? So then, what would negative punishment be? Negative punishment is when something is removed, right? So a pleasant consequence is removed. Um, following a response, so look at her. She's giving her away her car keys. She's been grounded. She doesn't have privileges anymore. She That is a negative punishment, right? So how many of you, well, I can't see you, but you've probably heard of time out, right? There was a picture of time out. So time out is supposed to be a negative punishment because in time out, you're not being smacked or tor you know tortured in any way, but you are supposed, the idea of, of time out is that you've been removed from the fun, right? And put into like a neutral environment. Right? And that's supposed to be punishing so that you don't do the behavior anymore. And you know that it's working as punishment if you don't do the behavior anymore after you do it. Has anyone ever, well, I know we have a, um, I can't see your faces, but has anyone ever had a situation where you felt like timeout was used and it didn't work? Right? That maybe you were put in timeout. Has anyone ever been put in timeout in their room, but your room is awesome? Has that ever happened to anyone? Give me a quick yes or a, there you go, I got a yes. Ha ha, me, yes, LOL. Okay, so here's a great example of how timeout is being misused, right? Thank you so much for answering. Uh, <laughs> right, so if you are sent to your room for timeout, but you love your room, that's not a punishment, right? Um, because your parents may have thought it was a punishment, but if you enjoy being in your room, your room has all your devices and whatever, whatever, then it wasn't a punishment, right? Maybe it was, it was even a reinforcement, right? So someone noticed that I was put in a corner. That was maybe a more effective timeout. I wanna tell you one, a little story about how I misused timeout when my daughter was two years old. Um, and I, I, this story still gets me because um, it took me so long to figure out what the problem was. So my daughter, what is now 12. So this is a long time ago story, but I've never forgotten it because I really 
had a hard time figuring out what was going on. So I was at a UMW run Passover Seder. So the UMW um, Hillel Jewish organization every year runs this beautiful Passover Seder. And I attended with my family and it was absolutely lovely. And we walked in and we it was at the dining hall. So we paid a fee because we were gonna get fed dinner. And then a nice man at the dining hall like waved to my daughter and she like waved back and she really liked him. And he was so friendly and she was like, oh. And then we went to our table and for like a really long time, it what hadn't started yet. So she was like running around and, you know, talking to other, uh, she had some other friends there. And then it was time to start. And we all had to be quiet and sit in our seat, okay? So she did not, I was like, Emily, sit down. You have to be quiet. And she smacks her brother, which her brother is two years older than her, he was four. I was like, Emily, and first of all, I'm in front of all of my students, right? Um, and, you know, my daughter's misbehaving, so I have to show like I'm a I'm a good mom and I'm a psychologist. I know what I'm doing. So Emily, don't hit your brother. You have to go into time out. So I pick her up and I parade her in front of like all the students to the front of where we pay the money, kind of to the hallway, right outside. She waves to the guy who's taking the money. She sits in the hallway and she seems really kind of happy, but I'm like, time out. I'm doing the right thing. And she goes back sits back down and guess what she does? Can anyone guess what she does? Immediately, you can type it in. Smacks him, she absolutely smacks him. <laughs> she smacked her brother, you guys are on it. Right here, <gasps> Emily, do not smack your brother, now I'm embarrassed, like she's really misbehaving in front of all my students. You have to go into time out. So I pick her up, parade her in front of everyone, she's like, hey, <laughs> so I sit her down, she's waving to the nice guy taking the money. And I wait, you know, I'm trying to like two minutes, right? One minute per year, right? Take her back. Guess what she does? Anyone want to guess? She smacks him. You will not believe this. This happened five times. Five times. I'm like, Emily, it did not. I was like, it's time out. This is what I should be doing. You give time out. I, I, I teach this. I had probably been teaching it that semester in general psychology. And I was like, What's, what's going on? Oh, this is not a punishment. This is reinforcement. She's loving this time out. She is, first of all, it's positive reinforcement because she's like waving to the nice guys, taking the money. And it's also negative reinforcement because I'm, she doesn't want to be in the room where she has to sit down and be quiet. She wants to be out in the hallway where she can be more squirmy or whatever. So this was totally, it was reinforcing because every time I did it, it increased the likelihood that she smacked her brother again. And I did it five times parading her in front of all the students. I was so embarrassed and it still occurred to me what was happening. And I went, this is not punishment. This is reinforcement. Um, so the sixth time she smacked her brother, um, I put her in her stroller and I turned her to the wall. So that one, the, the, one who, the one who said um, in the corner, she did not like that. And so after I did that, she did not smack her brother. So there you go. That is an example of how we can misuse timeout. We can think that timeout is really a, a parenting 101. There you go. Um, we think timeout is, is gonna be a punishment and it sounds like timeout, but sometimes it can be a reinforcer. If you're, if you're getting somebody out of a situation, so another example of a misuse of timeout, imagine there's a kid in a, in a classroom and he's so frustrated with his math, right? that he's like, rips up his math textbook. And the teacher is shocked and goes, oh my gosh, this is terrible. You need to go and sit outside of the classroom. And the kid sits out of the class, and, and the, the kid sits outside of the classroom, right? And what? guess what? The kid doesn't have to, he's not doing his math. Well, that seems like timeout, but it's not because he's, it's actually negative reinforcement. The math was removed, right? Um, and the, so the math was the bad thing and it was removed. So you have to be careful when you do something that seems like time out, that you think it's a punishment, it's not a punishment if it's not decreasing the likelihood of future behavior, right? So that's there my list, little lesson of parenting 101. Okay, so now we're gonna do a series of kind of interactive, if I was seeing you in person, I would call on you and your hands would be in the air. So instead, this is a multiple choice. So if you clean the house to stop your mother from nagging you. I see some comments, by the way, about the pacer test, which <laughs> my kids hate the pacer test, so that would definitely be a, be a punishment for them. 
Um, okay. 75, I think, is back and forth and back and forth, right? That would, that would be definitely a punishment. Okay, so somebody here, any of you, which one is this? I want you can either write A, B, C, or D in the chat, or just write positive reinforcement, negative reinforcement, <laughs> um, positive punishment, negative punishment. So clean if you clean the house to stop your mother from nagging you. Somebody, somebody wrote B. Let's hear some more. I hear lots of Bs. This is an, and I hear a D. So I hear mostly Bs and one negative punish and one D. So let's see. What is it? First of all, let's decide. Is it reinforcement or punishment? If your mother has been nagging you, nagging you, nagging you, nagging you, and then you clean the house, and then she stops nagging you, that's good, right? Like, you want her to stop nagging. The nagging has stopped. The, the horrible nagging has stopped. And are you more likely to clean the house in the future? You probably are. So those of you who said B, awesome job. Let's try another one. Turning down the volume of a very loud radio. All right, let's see. I'll look in the chat to see what you have to say. So the radio is loud. I, okay, I see a B and I see an A. Let's hear some other people. So I hear one person who says positive reinforcement, one person who says negative reinforcement. B, B, B. I'm getting a lot of negative reinforcements and that, again, is correct. Let's think through this. The radio, it's so loud, it's hurting your ears. That's a bad, aversive, terrible, terrible feeling. And you turn it down and it's better. You're, you're happier. So you're more likely to turn it down in the future. You guys are rocking it. Okay, so now I'm gonna tell you a story that you often see, more parenting one-on-one, -on -one, um, to explain what you might often see like uh, in a parenting situation. You know, have you ever noticed that at the supermarket, the candy is almost always at eye level? Like just, at, at, not even at adult eye level, at child eye level, it's almost cruel, right? Right, um, so that if you have a child walking down in the checkout counter um, of the supermarket, they're gonna be like, oh, I want the candy. So now the kid, from the kid's perspective, they're gonna say, scream, I want candy. Now, maybe they then get candy. If the kid screams from the kid's perspective, from the kid's perspective, I am the kid, I scream, give me candy! And then I get candy. What is that positive or negative reinforcement? Am I getting something or is something being taken away? I'm seeing lots of A's and the word positive and you are 100% right. The kid who is screaming is getting the candy. Positive reinforcement. Now why in the world is the mother gonna give this kid candy? Cause the mom might have a headache, right? Or the dad, right? Let's not be sexist here, right? The parent, this kid is screaming. And the kid, <laughs> they want the kid to stop screaming or just maybe she's embarrassed or maybe it's just loud and she just wants the kid to stop, right? So you give the kid the candy, the kid stops screaming. So what type of, the parent, we <laughs> have to run the pacer. <laughs> yeah, the parent is also getting reinforced in the situation. And what kind of reinforcement? I'm getting one B, A, I hear a positive. Remember, the kid is screaming, then they give, the kid is screaming, scream, 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 ah! Give the candy, the screaming stops. The screaming stops. So what 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 is going on here? I hear a B. B, B, that is correct. From the perspective of the parents, right? From the perspective of the parents, the stopping of the screaming is negative reinforcement. So now we see why a parent might give a screaming child candy because they're being negatively reinforced because the um, screaming is stopping. So what do you do if your child is screaming for candy in the supermarket? What should you do? Ignore them. I hear ignore them. <laughs> I feel like they give them the pacer test. You guys are obsessed with the pacer test. Imagine that in the supermarket. That might get disruptive. So yeah, a great um, suggestion is to ignore them, right? To not give them the positive reinforcement for the for the candy. Of course, if you're the parent, right? Um, you're being very much punished by ignoring them because they're screaming and screaming and screaming. And then the fact is, is that if you tell, if you tell a parent, just ignore it, they'll stop screaming. Is it going to work right away? Is the kid going to be like, oh, 
No, it's not going to work right away. The kid is going to be like, what? <laughs> right? Uh, the screaming used to work, and now it's not. I know what I'll do. I'll scream louder. And the parent, if you're the therapist, so the child psychologist, you give them good advice. Just stop screaming. Then they'll stop. Just stop. Don't give them the candy. Then they'll stop screaming. Right? And if you don't warn them that they might, the screaming might get worse first, they're going to tell you you're a very bad therapist because you didn't warn them that sometimes the behavior will get worse if you try to ignore it. So a better suggestion than maybe just ignoring it would be to find a positive behavior to redirect the child to maybe ask for something that they are allowed to have in a calm voice. Right. Tell them, oh, there's going to be someone suggested there's food at home that we can have. Right. To keep them so that you are reinforced so that you can find something good. Get them to ask for something appropriate that they maybe can have. Um, or if you know you're going to give them the candy to begin with. Right. Just give them the candy when they're for as a as a reward for acting properly in the supermarket. Right. Um, or or disguise, somebody suggested disguise the veggie in, in candy. There you go, right? So you if you just ignore it after you've been always giving them the candy, you're going to get worse screaming. You could wait it out and consistently ignore it as long as you're consistent, but it'd be better to try to find a positive behavior that you want to reinforce. Okay, here's one. You are grounded after you hit your sister. None of you would do that, I'm sure, but you're, what is being grounded? Put it in the chat. Let's see. D. I hear a D. Do I hear any other answers? Let's get. Oh, I hear D, D, D. I hear one B and lots of Ds. So it's getting grounded. The B is negative reinforcement. If you are grounded after you hit your sister, are you more or less likely to hit your sister? Hopefully, you're less likely to hit your sister, right? So it's pro. It should be a punishment. But being grounded is a negative punishment. So those of you who put D, awesome job. It's a negative punishment. You're having privileges removed. Okay. Rushing home in the winter to get out of the cold. I'm in the cold. It's freezing. I'm going to run, 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 run. And the behavior is running. And then what happens? I get in and I feel great. I hear a B. Going once, going twice. I hear a few Bs. You may have noticed that I'm asking a lot of questions where B is the answer. It's because negative reinforcement is the one that people most often confuse. But you're absolutely right. It's negative reinforcement. The cold, it's kind of like putting up your umbrella in the rain, right? It's rushing home so that the cold, you're no longer cold. Okay, this one's easy. Gold star, good behavior. I hear only one answer. Come on. This one's easy. Yeah, you got it. Oh, I love it. The double explanation points, right? There we go. Positive reinforcement. So now that you've got the basic principles down, let's just talk a little bit more about how we might use um, these principles of operating conditioning to uh, modify behavior in an everyday format. And we've already been talking a lot about that, about how you want to make sure you're not misusing time out, how you want to make sure that you are um, appropriately um, rewarding the behavior you want to see. You don't want to accidentally reward. You do get a gold star. Someone asked, do we get a gold star? I wish I had them. I'm give him, give him to you. I know in Zoom you can give people like high fives or thumbs up. So I'm just going to give you that, right? Um, so other um, applications of operant conditioning, um, and and in my class we would talk a little bit more about this, but um, I don't know if any of you have heard of applied behavioral analysis. It's a technique that is used to work with children with autism, um, and it uses the principles of operant conditioning um, to teach very specific skills that are broken down little by little using reinforcement to teach those skills. So maybe the skill is to make eye contact because a lot of children with autism may have a difficult time making eye contact. So um, using applied behavioral analysis, you might first give a give an instruction like look at me. Right. And then if they look at you, you'd say good job. And sometimes you might pair that with a primary reinforcer like like a little bit of cookie or something, but eventually you'd want to not be using cookies all day because that's not super healthy. You would want to eventually uh, mostly give secondary reinforcers like a good job or awesome or a sticker or some kids might want to work for a puzzle. Um, and you would do these trials and get them to um, 
do the behavior. Maybe it's eye contact. I used applied behavioral analysis when I was an undergraduate in the 90s, and I taught a little boy a lot of language that way. I would teach him to speak with different words, um, and we would break down the sounds into little components. And um, you know, if he couldn't do it, we would kind of show him, um, and then he would he would eventually he was able to learn to speak. So behavior modification um, is useful in the classroom. It's useful as a parent, but in a very systematic way, it's been used um, to help children with autism. Okay, we're going to talk a little bit about some issues. Whoa, this, is the, this slide comes in a little fast, so I apologize about that. Um, about some issues with punishment and then some issues with reward. And then we're going to wrap up and give you some time for questions. So punishment is a tricky issue in psychology because um, we don't want to be punishing people too much, but it can be effective. So hold on, I'm going to go back and show you this, this slide. The animation is a little wonky, but it works when it happens immediately after the behavior and it's more likely to work when it's mild. So some people think that more harsh punishment actually works better, but that's actually not the case. I'm not sure if this is true for you, but my children are more punished if I'm like, I'm disappointed in you. That's to them is like the most punishing thing I could possibly say. Um, so it's a very effective punishment to be more mild and to be kind of more socially based. Um, and then punishment needs to be consistent, right? Because if you only occasionally, let's say your kid occasionally is stealing cookies and you only punish them when you catch them, the kid is not learning to not steal cookies. What is the kid learning? You can type it if you want. To be sneaky, right? To not get caught, right? We have to be consistent with the punishment or all they learn is how not to get caught. Um, so there's a lot of ways punishment can fail. Oh, and this is, again, it's going to come in really fast, and then we can kind of talk through these uh, <laughs> to get cookies at midnight like a smart person. So that, that would maybe is a good skill. So sometimes here, I'm going to go back, and we can go through these. Punishment is administered inappropriately or mindlessly. So um, sorry, I can't get this to unanimate. But it. Um, so sometimes punishment is done out of anger as opposed to out of like a thoughtful um, way of saying, oh, you've done a bad behavior. I am now going to use punishment as a behavioral modification technique. Here is your punishment. Sometimes punishment is done in anger, right? And then it doesn't work as well. Sometimes people um, use punishment um, when people, th th that instead of responding, oh, I'm not going to do that behavior anymore, especially if the punishment is harsh, the response is more fear or anger or learning that hitting, if, if the punishment is like hitting or spanking, that learning that that's what you do when, when people make you mad, right? Um, and so we don't necessarily want people always to be, you know, parents might want their kids to fear them, but a lot of parents would rather have a relationship with their kids that's not necessarily based on fear. So if it's if your child is learning to fear you, that can be problematic. Punishment is also often temporary. So like we said, people might just learn not to get caught and they don't learn to actually not do the behavior, right? A big problem with punishment, how many of you have ever tried to like train a dog using punishment? Has anyone ever tried that? Um, or you can, um, Right. Yeah. Right. So this is something that people make a mistake with. Right. Yeah. So you are you're saying spray with water, which is a great example of a not too harsh punishment. And it works when it happens immediately after the animal does the bad thing. What doesn't work is if let's say you've left the house for a few hours and your dog is like pooped on the floor and then you come home and you see the poop and you're like, no. Right. Um, and you take your dog and you like punish him. You're like, bad dog, bad dog, right? Or you even, sometimes people like put the dog's nose in the poop, but the dog doesn't get it, right? The dog is like, what? You know, um, why? I was laying on the couch. What did I do wrong? Like the dog doesn't understand. So if the punishment doesn't happen immediate, um, I, I mean, the, then it's very hard for people to understand what's going on, right? Um, and a few of you are mentioning shock collars, which I am actually not, I don't have it, I'm not for cat people, not dog people, so I don't totally understand how shock collars work. But I think a lot of you are commenting that they're not good or bad. I, I'm guessing that's probably because they're too harsh, right? Um, I can't say I'm an expert on shock collars. 
I am, I am a cat person. I'm much more into spraying the cat when he jumps on the table. Although I must admit, we just like I was a terribly inconsistent, did very bad punishing of my daughter, we are not very good about controlling the behavior of our cats. They are they're relatively naughty and go on the table. So uh, it's easier. A lot of this is easier said than done, yes? Um, okay. The fourth thing, the fifth thing here says, I'm just going to run through these again so you can see them because the animation comes in super fast is it's temporary it doesn't follow the behavior and it doesn't tell you what to do it only tells you what not to do right so if you say you can like yell at your kids and say don't be disrespectful right play nice with your sister but like that doesn't like communicate like really often important like information like how do you share how do you take turns right like how do you what what do you actually have to do to play nice or to be respectful and then the final one is that punishment can sometimes be reinforcing. So that's often the case um, with timeout, like we talked about earlier. But it can even be the case with more of a positive punishment, like even a, so a, if a kid isn't getting any attention at all from their parents. And so the one time they pay attention is when they're in trouble. Um, that punishment actually might be reinforcing. So um, these are all problems with punishment. So reward in many ways is better than punishment, right? Um, so what are we going to do we, if we if we don't want to punish, right? And we've already talked about this a little bit. Um, you got to teach that that problem solving skills, right? You need to say, okay, well, here's how we take turns, and here's how you express your frustration. If you're frustrated with math, instead of saying, you know, ripping up the math paper, raise your hand and say, I could use some help with this problem, please, right? Then we talked about rewarding good behavior. Right. So um, sometimes one advice a psychologist will give to parents is to catch your child being good. Right. Um, so a lot of times when parents get into like negative dynamics with their kids, it's often um, it's often always like the kid is misbehaving, the parent is punishing and the kid is and then the kid is upset and the kid is misbehaving and the parent is punishing and the kid is upset. And sometimes parents aren't attuned to when their children are being good, right? And so a uh, nice parenting advice is to like catch your child, hey, find a time, oh, I really like the way you're, you know, sitting quietly at the table, thank you so much, or I really appreciate that you, you know, help me carry this bag, right? Like anything that you can find um, where your child is good, give them a compliment, reward them, and that can make a huge difference because people are craving these posi the positive reinforcements. We can try to ignore behavior, right? We talked about that with the screaming child of the candy. Often if we're only going to use ignoring, um, it's gonna, the behavior might get worse first, so you need to be careful. Um, so combining ignoring the bad behavior and then reinforcing good behavior is a great um, technique. So I see in the chat, you guys are talking about the use of shock collars, which I am not as familiar with. So. How are you going to train? How does the so those of you who are using training your dog not to run on the street? How do you do that? Are you using principles of operating conditioning? I'm betting you are. I'm betting you're reinforcing your dog when they're near you, right? Um, or maybe there's some kind of punishment when they run away, right? <laughs> and puppies are hard. This is why we're cat people. Um, as my last comment here we're going to talk about how even though rewards are great they can actually backfire um so can anyone um oh i love this comment though someone says they use the word stay and come and then with a treat so that is positive reinforcement that is a perfect example of positive reinforcement right um yeah, so understanding operating conditioning is perfect when we're dealing with animals because that's exactly how they operate. Now, our last thing to talk about is this notion that sometimes rewards can backfire. Um, and that happens when, if you read this, it says extrinsic reinforcers may undermine intrinsic reinforcers. So let's talk about this experiment they did because it's actually pretty interesting. Um, they had a bunch of children and there were these really cool like felt tip markers, okay? And they um, put these kids into two groups, 
okay? And all the kids were like, cool, awesome, amazing felt tip markers. I'm going to color with these, okay? But they randomly um, split the kids into two groups. And for some of those groups, after they played with the felt tip markers, they were like, awesome, you played with the felt tip markers. You're amazing. You get a prize. So that's the pink group. Um, and then the other group, they didn't, they were just like, yeah, whatever, those felt tip markers are cool. And then like a few days later, they gave them, they put them back and they, um, and they showed them the felt tip markers again. And the kids who had been given a reward, who had been told, yay, felt tip markers, you are, you get a prize for playing with them. Do you see what happened to them? They didn't play with them because what do you think they were thinking? They were probably like, whatevs where's my prize oh i'm not going to get a prize this time i'm not going to play with this the felt markers are only there because i'm going to get a prize for them the people the kids who had never gotten a prize for it just kept on playing with it because they were cool right so i wonder if we can think for a minute of an example where you do something that maybe it was fun it could have been fun on your own but if you were reinforced if you are given a prize for it, all of a sudden it feels like work and you might not want to do it anymore. Can anyone think of an example? We can still talk about the, I see you guys are chatting about your dogs, which is very good. Cleaning your room, oh, that's a good example. So maybe you want a clean room, right? Um, and that's just something that you're personally proud of, but then your mom is like, great job, you cleaned your room, cheers. Two dollars. So now, then you're like, well, now I'm only gonna clean my room for getting for the money, or maybe getting into college, right? Or getting a grade, right? If your parents are paying, like some people's parents may have like paid them for grades. I don't know if that's a thing, right? But if that's the case, you might be, you might only think the grades are worth it, right? If you're getting paid, something, something that I always think about in this context is like reading for pleasure, right? Like reading, hopefully, should be fun, right? Um, what I always found, I don't, I don't know if anyone got paid for getting good grades, but someone in a, in a big class, some, some kids were. Um, but I don't know if you've ever been involved in any of these library reading programs, and they can be effective, but I noticed with my kids, they backfired because um, my kids love to read on their own, and once we whenever we would sign up for these library reading programs where they had to write down like what they write what they would read and then they would have to like track their hours of reading and then they would like get a prize for reading um it took the fun of reading and my kids when we would sign up for these problems for these programs they would literally not read if they didn't have like a pen and paper to track their hours like they wouldn't just sit down and read a book right um yeah, so here, it's, Kathy says, I used to read all the time until we had a tracker reading in school. Now, all of a sudden, reading becomes um, a something that you do because you're getting reinforced for it and you're not doing it for pleasure anymore. Um, so it becomes like a chore. Exactly. Thank you, Dayton. Perfect, perfect example, right. Um, this happens to artists sometimes, right? Like if they, if people, are become artists and they just love it and they just paint for pleasure and if they start selling their art i mean that's wonderful everyone would love to make a artist would love to make a living selling their art but it changes their relationship with their art now their art is something they're doing for money for a reinforcement and it and it um it can lose its intrinsic joy so for certain things that we should love to do on our own like studying for school right yay um or reading or doing art or even cleaning our room if you know we like clean rooms i wish my kids were like you because they definitely do not have any intrinsic love of cleaning the room um if we do too much reward it can have the potential to backfire so that is the end of my remarks so i it is now time for open discussion about psychology, anything you want to talk about, operant conditioning, or the psychology major. Um, before this whole song and dance started, I did get, um, some of you had submitted some questions about the psychology major. So what I would love, I'm going to sip my water, but what I would love is for you, if you have any questions about 
Mary Washington, about the psychology major, put them in, you can start typing them in the chat and I'm gonna answer, um, and I'm gonna <laughs> answer the questions that was already posted, which was several questions. So the first question was, I hope I remember them all, um, how big are the classes? So in our department in psychology, our classes range in size. The biggest class you will ever take in psychology is general psychology, which taps out, maxes out at 70, which is pretty big, but nothing gets bigger than that. I teach general psychology, and honestly, um, with, even with 70 people, we have an absolutely wonderful, fantastic time. Um, most of our classes are about 25 people, um, and so there's opportunity to get to know your classmates, the opportunity to, um, you know, get to know the professors really well, and then we have a lot of smaller classes. So our, um, we have a, several classes that are 20, and then our upper level senior seminars where we do research are 16. And then for some students, we have a whole year long opportunity for research where you work individually with faculty and those groups are four or five students. And that is super fun. And this would be something you would do your senior year where um, where you would um, work really closely with faculty on research in really small groups. I have a group of five this year and we are actually as our project going into Riverview public schools and we're going to do a mindfulness curriculum that um, I'm working with a school social worker and we're going to evaluate it. We're going to give like questionnaires to the students and the teachers kind of before, during and after the curriculum and see how it affects the, this, the entire first grade of the school. So I'm super, super excited about that. Um, and different faculty do different research. Um, the second question that was already asked was, how hard is the workload? And that's a hard question to answer. Um, um, that That's gonna depend on the professor. You know, like my general psych class, we have readings, we have exams, um, you know, so in, in other classes, there's gonna be papers, um, there's gonna be group projects. Um, so each professor is gonna be a little different. It's hard for me to say how hard or easy. Every class is different. It's gonna, each class is gonna be more work than high school, but you also take fewer classes, right? So you're gonna be taking only five classes and each class is only three hours a week. So for three credits, it's three hours a week. So you're only in class, let's say 15 hours a week, more if you have a lab class. So even though it's going to be more work, you have all that, you have more time outside of school. So it's more of an expectation that you're going to be working outside of the classroom, doing reading, taking online tests, studying on your own, um, doing different kinds of homework. So a little more personal responsibility for the learning because we'll be giving assignments that you'll do outside of class, but less time in class. Um, I feel like there was a third question, which was, I think the question was how, like, can there be new classes added um, into the psychology curriculum? And the answer is occasionally there can be new classes um, added. Um, usually that's based on if there's a faculty who wants to introduce a new class. We've had like a, recently we had a positive psychology class added. Um, sometimes faculty will do special topics classes. We have a faculty who has an expert on um, like trauma and mass shootings and she did a class all about that, which is like super interesting. Um, but if a student has a topic that they super want to study, they can in, um, work with the faculty on a, um, kind of independent reading or independent study, but um, but it, there's not, we don't, we're not adding classes left and right. So that's the questions that were already asked. Um, <laughs> I see you're all saying hi to each other, which is wonderful. Hello, hello. Any, any Chancellor High School students? I asked that because my husband is a Chancellor High School guidance counselor. So if any, any Chancellor High School students shout out, um, let me know. Are there any other questions that I can ask, answer about psychology, about Mary Washington, about anything? I know it's sad that COVID, can I bring my dog? Uh, <laughs> okay, what's my favorite class to see? This is going fast. Okay, ooh, okay. These are some, some of these questions I'm not 100% sure of the answer. Um, admissions people, I think that you, 
that, that there are special regulations for comfort animals yeah. in terms of bringing dogs. Is that correct? Okay. I don't I don't want to give the wrong information. So I'm gonna throw, I'm gonna I'm gonna bring in the admissions expert here. Yes. Um, bringing your dog. We do have service animals on campus. There are several service animals. So when you get your or when you start filling out some of your questionnaires, they will ask or you do have a spot on there where you can say yes, I don't mind if my roommate has a dog um, or no, I do mind because I'm allergic, right? So you do have those options. Service animals are more than okay. Comfort animals, there are um, forms for you to fill out um, showing that you need them. For the AP questions this year, AP got a little wonky with, <laughs> to say the least, we are still accepting AP credits. We take AP, we take IB. If you guys do any dual enrollment classes, all of those are good. AP, normally you need a three or better. IB is a six, a six or better, and dual enrollment is a C or better. Um, you guys will let us all know. You turn in all of your stuff, and everything will be um, evaluated for you. Okay? Um, and AP psychology will get you out of general psychology. So that always makes me sad because I teach general psychology. So I, I, I still like you to take it. <laughs> it's still fun if you take it, but if you get out of it, that's great um, for, for AP psych. Um, someone asked what math level is needed for the major. I assume you mean the psychology major. So um, for our major, for, for the gen eds, for the students coming in, you need to take one um, quantitative reasoning class. Um, and then within our psychology major, we have a two semester statistics sequence. So we call um, Psych 261 baby stats and then Psych, psych 360 advanced stats. Um, if you took the AP, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll answer that in a second. Um, so um, you're gonna take, and, and it's, it's not expected that you have a statistics background to take the statistics sequence in psychology. If you're feeling nervous about it because you hate math and statistics, I would recommend that the math class you take as your quantitative reasoning class be stats 180 because that has some overlapping material and will prepare you really well for psych stats. Someone asked if you should retake gen psych. I'm mostly kidding. I just love to see all your faces. Um, I'd say if you placed out of gen psych, go ahead and skip it. Don't waste the credits, right? You've already taken it. Um, I just, I just sad to lose all the bright students who took AP Psych um, in my classes, but no, don't re don't retake it. I mean, you've already gotten, you already have the credit for it. That to me seems like it would be a, be a waste. Um, what else? What are other credits? You guys are so cute. You're making doggy play dates. I love it. Um, <laughs> I'm not joining for that. Like I said, I am a cat person. <laughs> so, um, with only a mild, like, I'm a teeny bit afraid of big dogs. I like a little, a good small dog. Let's see, are there other questions that I missed in the chat? Um, somebody asked if somebody's parents can adopt them. I cannot help you with that. Um, any other questions about psychology? Brandon had a question about what psychology classes already exist. Oh, wow, you should look on our website. We have a ton of, Yay, two cats. Um, a ton of great psychology classes. So the way our major is organized, and I don't have it all memorized off the top of my head, but um, for uh, all psychology majors take general psychology and then our statistics and methods sequence. Um, so baby stat, advanced stat, and then methods. And then in methods, you do your own study, so you collect data. So I'm answering what class, classes are required now. Um, and then there's a senior kind of um, senior research project. That's either a one semester senior seminar um, or a whole year long research team like I was saying that I do with was doing with my students. In addition to that, there are four kind of um, areas of psychology that you have to take at least one class from. So one is the biological area. So we have some really cool classes like biopsych and cognitive neuroscience and psychopharmacology and sensation and perception. Then there's the cognitive area, which has learning and motivation cognitive psychology, and then um, cognitive neuroscience actually can be either. Then there's the developmental sequence, which you have to take either. Our developmental sequence is split by age, so you have to take either infant and child, adolescent, adult, or aging. So like one of the three. 
And then there's the social personality, which is my area. I teach, oh, I teach in this area a lot, which has social psychology, abnormal psychology, and personality psychology. Those are my favorite. You can, <laughs> I'm like, take all of those, but you need at least one of those. So you need one from the four domains, um, and then you need the general psych, baby stat, advanced stat, methods, and senior experience. Um, either the one semester seminar or the whole year, and then you need an out of class experience. So that can be an internship. That can be um, we can we have we have a program called community service learning um, where you're kind of volunteering in the community. Or if you do the year long research team, that actually counts both for your research experience and your out of class experience. But then you can take a bunch of electives. So you need 37 credits, so that doesn't add up to 37, you need more and you have you have to, uh, a lot of our, our students love our classes, so they tend to take well more than 37, unless they're double majoring, then they're, you know, kind of getting it all in. Um, so we tend to, uh, uh, so, so there's a lot of wonderful electives to take. Psychology is a BS, it's a bachelor's in science. Other questions. Now we have a play date with the dogs and the birds and even the cats. I think my cats would not like that though. Um, <laughs> any other questions? We have a lot of wonderful faculty who all have very different research areas. We have um, some clinical psychologists. I'm a clinical psychologist, but I teach general psychology, personality, Psychology of Women, I actually wrote the textbook for Psychology of Women, so that is actually the thing I'm most proud of, well, I'm proud of my children, too, but writing this textbook was one of the things I'm most proud of in my life, um, so she takes Psycho Women with me. Um, also, my colleague also wrote the textbook, so you could take it with her, Dr. Mindy Urchel, she's also fantastic. Um, we have social psychologists. Um, who study eating. We have social psychologists who study how people kind of oh, environmental issues. We have a guy who works with rats. We actually have a, a, a colony of rats that we um, keep or, um, to run experiments with. We just hired two new faculty. Um, we hired another clinical psychologist who does kind of electrophysiological -physiolo stuff that's super interesting on relationships and jealousy. And we hired a new cognitive psychologist who does stuff on how we learn and think about stuff. I don't remember all the details. Bring the rats on the, on the play date. <laughs> I, don't, I am not bringing the rats. Those are not my, <laughs> that, is, that is not what I'm doing. I'm, I am not the rat person. We'll have to invite Stallman. <laughs> Stallman, by the way, because um, working with rats is all about operating conditioning. Stallman, our rat guy, is a radical behaviorist. So he is just like Skinner. Skinner is his role model. He thinks that thinking is overrated. He does not really believe in the power of thoughts to predict behavior. You can get into some serious conversations with him about whether or not we need to think or if behavior is all we ever ever needs. So we have a, a real bona fide radical behaviorist on campus and he's pretty cool. He's our rat guy and he's, he's, he's very cool. So we have a lot of fantastic faculty who do a lot of great work and are, it's a fun department. We get along. We love our students. Um, so any other question? All right. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Doggy play date or cat, dog, bird, and maybe rat, but not rat play date is definitely on the books. <laughs> Any other questions? There's still 18 of you hanging in, so I'll, I'll be here for as long as you need me. But I think I've answered all the questions that were in the stream, unless I missed something. Some of you are popping out. Bye to everyone who's leaving, and I'll stick around and ask any questions that people have. <laughs> bye Claire thank you it was so much fun having you in the chat bye everyone have a great night if you're leaving but stick around if you have questions <laughs> you're dropping off I wish I could have seen your faces but it was fun chatting with you <laughs> hope to see you in the fall I will be teaching general psychology at 1 p.m. that's my section so if you are taking Gen Psych, if you haven't AP'd out of it, I'm teaching the 1 p.m. section. I, I don't remember what section number it is, but it's at 1. <laughs> all right, you're all popping out. 
We'll stick around for anyone who wants to chat. Oh, that's a great question. What is forensic psychology? So that is the study of um, kind of the intersection between psychology and the law. So there's a lot of parts of forensic psychology. Um, studying kind of the criminal mind is a part of it, but also more mundane things like custody evaluation and, you know, how to evaluate people if they're competent to stand trial. Um, uh, how to evaluate people if they're, you know, not guilty by reason of insanity. Um, so it's a pretty cool topic. I don't teach it, but it's cool. You're welcome, Brandon. I'm not sure, I'm not sure if I remember what your question was, but I'm glad I answered it. <laughs> Any other questions? I am still here. So what's cool? The five of you who are left, there's still a handful of you. Where are you all from? Tell me. Maybe you've walked off. Should I stop sharing my screen? I'm going to Stop the screen share. Then I can hand over Langley. Awesome. Wait, did I just stop the share? I think I did. You did. Oh, you did. Okay. Why do I want to save it? Yes, I do. I guess I changed the date on it. Okay. Hi, a few of you who are here. I'm happy to answer any more questions. We're so happy you're here. I know it's been a very crazy semester. I'm so sorry that your senior year of high school was uh, COVIDed out. It was really stinks for you. My son is in eighth grade, and so he's sad about the end of middle school, but I think it's worse for high school seniors. I hope your schools are doing something special for your graduation or special videos or something, but it's a kind of weird way to end, huh? Yeah. <laughs> it's, been a, it's, been a, it's been a strange year. <laughs> If you do come, there, Mary Washington is offering this uh, free class for incoming students and also regular students and community members. It's gonna be about COVID-19. Um, and it's gonna be free for all everyone in the Mary Wash community. Um, and it's gonna be like a cross-disciplinary class taught by everyone from mathematicians to geographers to theater people to social scientists. And I'm teaching the day on July 20th. Um, about mental health issues and stress and coping, and I'm going to be doing that with a, another colleague of mine, Dr. Rettinger, and he's going to talk more about um, risk assessment, like how do we decide if we're at risk. So, um, and that's a, it's a kind of a free, it's pass fail, but it's like a free class, um, so you can start with three credits, kind of get you ahead in terms of getting to the 120 to graduate, and I think it's going to be really interesting. So, that's a cool thing we're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you. I love it. I love all the, I love all the, the smiles and the explanation points. I wish I could see your faces, but this has been really fun. I'm happy to answer any more questions if you're hanging out. Hey, Takira. Hi. Are we? <laughs> I think we're good. So I will. Are we good? Uh, People are still on the chat, so I don't know if we're done, but <laughs> maybe they walked off. 